Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your hosts, Tim and Carter. What's trending in Richards? Carter Wilcoxie, founder of CSI Financial Group here with my co-host and former wealth advisor, Tim James, founder of chemicalfreebody.com and your new health advisor. This is the show where we reveal the connection between physical and financial abundance. Hey, hello, Enrichers. Carter Wilcoxon here once again on the Health and Wealth Podcast Show, joined by my esteemed co-host, Mr. Tim James of Chemical Free Body. Tim James, how are you, bud? Carter, I'm doing good. The rains have stopped in Portland. The blue sky is starting to pop out, and that means the merle mushrooms are in almost in full swing now. Nice. So, I'm heading out for Memorial Day weekend back to Eastern Oregon to go pick morel mushrooms and hang out with some of my redneck friends from days of old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I love that. And, you know, it's interesting this time of year in Phoenix, Arizona, which uh, I'm getting ready to introduce our, our guest that we're very uh, pleased to be able to uh, share a lot of his backstory and how he and I got connected at CSI Financial Group. But um, it's not even going to hit triple digits here in Phoenix, Arizona for the 10 day forecast, it sneaks up right at 98, 99, but in the morning, you know, me and my better half, Christina, um, episode three or four, I believe if you guys want to go back and find out more about my better half and your better half, Tim James, we go on a walk every morning and it's been like upper sixties. Um, when we first get out there on a walk, it's nice and chilly in Phoenix, Arizona, which is really strange this time of year. So, there you go. Each, um, each of these days is a gift. Each of these days is a gift. So mm -hmm. without further ado, I want to introduce Dennis Stack, formerly co-founder of Legacy Stories. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So Dennis, how are you doing out there in, uh, in the Superstition Mountains? Very good. So uh, good to be alive. <laughs> So, so Dennis and I, we go back, him and his co-founder, uh, Tom Cormier, we started talking about five years ago about their platform, and I loved it so much that I bought it. So, um, but Dennis, before we sort of get into legacy stories and how CSI Financial Group brings this as an additional value add to our advisor network, um, why don't you talk a little bit about you know, your backstory, where you came from, uh, you know, what sort of got you into the legacy, you know, industry, if you will. Well, it, uh, th thank you, Carter and Tim. Uh, it, it was a journey. It's a journey that I never envisioned what the end of that trail would look like uh, at the time I started. Uh, uh, as I was mentioned to Carter just before the call, I'm, uh, you know, displaying my age here, but I was studying for the Series 7 on the day that the Dow Jones cracked for the first time, 1,000 points. <laughs> so that was only 32,000 points ago in 30-some years. But, uh, yeah, I go back that far. I got hired against all odds by E.F. Hutton at the time. I got my training, got my uh, Series 7, and lived in a cubicle, dialing and smiling. Hey, and, and, and back then you could pass the series seven with a, like a 40 percentile, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. No, they gave us uh, one shot. You had to have over 75%. I mean, it was depends on the firm, but right, uh, basi right, right. basically uh, you gave, they gave us three months to study for the test, had to go sit it. It was a whole day test. It was the number two pencil filling in dots mm -hmm. And you didn't know for a week afterwards whether you passed or not. And I had a very... Uh, Sounds like our elections. Yeah, you know, if only. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I had to wait a week and I kept bothering the wire operator. I said, did the wire come in yet? Did I pass? Did I pass? Well, the manager was a real uh, funny guy, let's say, being, being charitable here. <laughs> He told the wire operator not to tell me when it came in and to give him the wire first. And I hear my name paged over the intercom. I go to his office. He has me uh, stand in front of his desk and looking me straight in the eyes. He goes, you failed. Clean out your desk. You're out of here. Wow. Just, just to see my reaction. 
And then he started laughing and said, no, you passed. Congratulations. <laughs> Go back to your cubicle and start dialing the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Bring some money in here already, Dennis. Yeah. So uh, with that inauspicious beginning, uh, I, I worked it just the way the wirehouse has taught us to. You dial up hundreds of people a day, and hopefully you find one or two that's willing to talk to you. And mm -hmm. I built my book the old-fashioned slow way. And um, along the way, I discovered through account titling that my clients that I had that had living trusts tended to be four to five times larger than all my joint tenants with right of survivorship clients were. And even though I passed Series 7, I had no clue what estate planning was or what living trusts were and the rest. And, and so I figured if, if I didn't know, my clients certainly wouldn't know. So I figured, hey, this is a great opportunity for public education. I uh, got out the yellow pages, which is something from the last century that we use to find things. <laughs> and I looked up a uh, local Mesa, the biggest law firm in Mesa, and called up, asked to speak to their estate planning attorney. They put me on with this lady, and I suggested that I wanted to put on a luncheon at the uh, Mesa Hilton Hotel for 500 people to learn about estate planning. Would she like to be the speaker? So strangely enough, she agreed. Uh, she came on, I packed the room, I paid for it myself at a time when I didn't have the money, but I did it anyway. Uh, she spoke and a week after that event, she wasn't returning my phone calls. She had left the big firm that she was in and set up her own shop and never looked back. She subsequently over the course of time did great uh, based on the hundreds of clients I basically put her in front of. Hmm. So I knew I had a formula there that was going to work. So instead of uh, depending on their, uh, their being fair and me helping them, them helping me, I, I spent about two weeks. I called about two dozen attorneys around the Valley, estate planners, and I told them who I was. I said I was a, an investment advisor. I had a book of clients that many of them needed estate planning advice. If I didn't recommend that attorney, Give me the names of two others. And after all those calls, one name kept coming up in every one of those two others from all these other attorneys. Uh, his name was uh, John Goodson. He passed uh, a few years ago. But I called him up, set up a breakfast meeting with him, and uh, it just went from there. I, I showed him how I wanted to build my book of business and that I could do so by helping him. And we ended up uh, doing for a couple of years series of continuing education seminars. We our, our big hit was uh, how medical practitioners can protect their assets from malpractice creditors. And uh, we packed uh, the Hilton for a steak dinner at my cost uh, on a weekly basis to talk to doctors. Uh, he got a lot of them as clients. I got a few of them as clients. Uh, but over the course of time, he gained greater confidence in my skills as an investment advisor, and he gave me one of his biggest clients. It was at the time, it wasn't ultimately my biggest client, but it was a $10 million account. And he was uh, uh, an old car, used car dealer in Phoenix who, you know, carried his own contracts and made lots of money. And I, I won him over. I won his confidence. As it turned out, he was the most cantankerous client this attorney had. And that was my test by fire for that attorney. And once I, I worked with that client and got his satisfaction, the floodgates opened. He, he and I went on to build a, a group we called Business Advisory Services, where I was the investment advisor. He was the estate planner. But we had other 10 other disparate professionals uh, insurance, uh, business management, uh, we, and this is back in the early 90s, we even had the life coach as part of our team. And together we ended up doing some amazingly great cases. There's a lot of very, very well-to-do family businesses here in the Valley, and we worked with a lot of them. And uh, through this process, I matured. My production every year went up and up and up. And it got to be uh, 
1998, uh, I was uh, I was kicking in full swing, and I had three different Klein events that came together that all left me questioning what I was doing and and what the industry was doing. And in one case, they were lottery winners. They won $64 million, a, a simple, recently retired blue-collar couple. Uh, they got referred to me. I had another client referred to me that won a $70 million personal injury lawsuit. It was uh, tragic. She suffered burns on a big part of you know, most of her body. But mm. uh, so she became a client. And then... My biggest client, one of my biggest clients at the time who I'd worked with for more than a decade, passed away. And he was my first test uh, succession planning, if you want to call it that. And we had worked with this client for a long time. I had a very close personal relationship with the client. And, and that's when I discovered something that's unusual. And I'm sure both of you have experienced this yourself, that unlike other professionals, Wealth management, financial advisors garner a greater degree of trust with clients than virtually any other professional. I found myself constantly being cast somewhere between a psychotherapist and a marriage counselor. <laughs> it's, it's like we didn't always just talk about the markets and diversification and portfolios. Uh, they trusted my advice and my counsel enough that they would ask me things about their family, about their kids, about college, about their marriages. And I think part of it was because I didn't charge by the hour and they knew that I had a fiduciary like obligation that they could share things with me that would never be shared anywhere else. And as a consequence, I got to know my clients exceedingly well. I mean, I, I knew them personally. I knew their backstory, their histories. They knew and trusted me. I knew and trusted them. And in that process of building the, the, you know, the succession plans, plans for the future, they told me what their hopes and dreams were for their kids and their grandkids. And, you know, in that same year, 98, those three events I mentioned, one of them was his passing. And that's when I discovered what is a standard in the industry now is that succession plans fail only 94% of the time by the third generation. And, I was clueless to that fact prior to that event, but I witnessed as the why. And as it turns out, as soon as the primary client passed away, the successors, I had a tremendous relationship with him. His wife I'd met a few times, as the client said, for the just in case. Uh, but I never developed a relationship with the kids or any of the rest of the family. And when he passed, I lost that account. One of the kids said, he had a buddy from the frat house that just got his Series 7, so he was going to have him manage it all. And so I was uh, disappointed, to say the least, but uh, I kept in enough contact with the family to see what happened over the course of just the next 18 months, and it was devastating. None of it had anything to do with my client's hopes and wishes. It was, it was 180 degrees out from that. That was very disheartening. And going back to the lottery winners, they shared with me uh, in confidence, of course, that they wish they had never won that money because their lives changed in ways they could have never predicted. They did all the usual things. They helped their kids pay off their mortgages and things like that. But uh, I discovered the, the dark side of nonprofits that when somebody like that, their name and their wealth goes public, uh, they're not prepared to say no. They get a hard luck call from every charity on the planet and, you know, the, the, the checkbook was out. And they got to the point where they had to move away to a gated community, get an unlisted number. And and he, he, he confided in me, said, Dennis, you know, this winning the lottery, winning all that money didn't change me at all, but it changed everyone he knew. He used to like going to the bar that he and his former co-workers would go to for happy hour, you know, after work occasionally. And after he won, he went there. And of course, he bought rounds for everybody. And then it became expected. He was expected to buy all the rounds all the time. And 
And he says he hated it because he hadn't changed at all, but everyone treated him as a completely different person. So his life was turned upside down. And then the the third one, the personal injury lawsuit settlement, uh, she used the money as a crutch, if you will. I mean, she was somewhat disfigured. She was still a very attractive woman, but she went through in a period of less than 12 months, three different boyfriends. The first one got himself a condo. The second one got him, uh, you know, a super expensive car. And they, they all just took her for what they could get. And, and she got messed up. So at the time I go, what's wrong with this picture? How can it be that people can come into this insane amount of wealth and immediately destroy themselves? So I ponied up some money and contracted an ASU psychology professor to research what I dubbed at the time sudden wealth syndrome. <laughs> and he did some great research. Uh, the state of Illinois has been one that's had the lottery for longer than many other states. And he researched it and he generated a tremendous report, talked about control issues and loss of control. And I kind of summed it up pretty simply saying is that if you if you earn something, if that something you earn comes from the sweat of your brow, from, left from the imagination of your mind, that something you get is worth something. But if somebody gives you something, doesn't matter how big it is, it's bigger, it makes it worse. If you get something for nothing, it's worth nothing. And so consequently, uh, I realized that the only true happiness with wealth is when wealth is earned. When wealth isn't earned, it doesn't bring happiness. It brings excess. It brings, a, you know, a complete flip of your life and your world. And so that's what first got me going on this. And contemporary to that, uh, I'd lost my father shortly before my my own only daughter was born. I wasn't close. He was a workaholic his whole life, never knew him to take a vacation, never knew him to have less than two jobs. He was uh, long on discipline, short on praise. I was the fifth of six kids and largely ignored. And uh, after I was well started into my career, I get a call and I knew it was from him. So I, I got off my other lines and took his call. And at the counseling of his hospice chaplain, he contacted each of his six kids. The chaplain urged him to share just one story. And the story he chose to pick was a time he was most proud. I got this call in the middle of my work day. And he told me of a moment from my teenage years when I was working for one of his many ventures in the construction industry. And and how I was installing lockers at a brand new inner city high school in Chicago. And I took off for lunch and came back to the workspace and found the principal and the gym coach looking at the blueprints. And they immediately laced into me and told me how I installed everything wrong. Now, I was a very uh, reserved, timid young man. And... When I when that happened, something just struck me and I didn't take it. I walked up to these two authority figures. I grabbed the blueprints from their hand, turned them right side up. And I told them that when they figure out what the hell they're doing, come find me. I got work to do. <laughs> and, and, and I walked out of the locker room. And as soon as I was out the door, I was shaking like a leaf. All of a sudden it hit me. I may have just destroyed my father's contract for this. You know, what was I going to do? And later that day, nothing came up about it. A week later, nothing. And I forgot about that moment altogether. I went on with my life. But that was the story he shared with me on that phone call. He apparently was just outside the door and he had heard everything that had happened. And he said that at that moment, he was so proud that his timid little son showed a backbone. That call lasted less than 10 minutes. And it was the last conversation I had. And it changed everything. I found the power of a story 
the right story. We never know which is the right story, but the power of a story can have life-changing co consequences. And in my case, it did. Every hard thought I ever had of my father evaporated. And there's so much more I would have wanted to know about the man, but it was too late. I consoled myself. I go, well, I can always ask my mom if there's things about my dad's life before I was born that I needed to know. Well, lead, way leads on to way. I never thought to ask. Two years later, after my daughter was born, two years after that, my mother came to visit here in Phoenix, uh, discovered she had Alzheimer's. She uh, it was a very difficult visit. She went back to upstate New York to one of my siblings. Uh, I went up there a year later to see her, and it was the, uh, the lights on, nobody's home. It looked like my mom. It sounded like my mom, but she was gone. And that flight back from, from upstate New York to Phoenix was just, I was total recrimination. I mean, I was just so disgusted with myself that I never thought to ask. The two people who loved me and raised me taught me. And I knew nothing about him, nothing I could share with my daughter. And that, that kind of brewed in me. And then, like I say, I had that event in 98 with those three different clients. It really sat me back and made me think about what the hell am I doing with my life? What are we trying to accomplish? There's got to be something more than just making lots of money. I had no problem making lots of money. I enjoyed it. But there had to be something more. And then uh, I ended up uh, getting out of production. I got recruited by then Payne Weber, later to become UBS, to become a branch manager. And I reduced my production from just shy of almost $2 million a year down to they maxed me at 500000 They capped me. So I had to shovel off a lot of my book because I had to be a manager. So passed my Series 8 and uh, spent a lot of time in New York for the first year or two. And uh, we had a graduation ceremony. We had a lot of our courses were in the trade centers. Our graduation ceremony, there was 25 of us in the training program that lasted a couple of years. Our, our graduation ceremony was in Tower 2 in July of 2001. A couple months later, I'm, I'm in my office, and, and it was a nice office in Scottsdale, and I was watching TV, and I saw the towers come down. I immediately thought of all those people that worked the building, you know, the, the, the guards, the janitors, all the people that I met in passing through all the times that I was there. In fact, one of my coworkers grew up there. His father was the lead partner of a major law firm. And everybody he knew died that day. Uh, when I saw the, what was going on, I sent everybody home except for myself and my ops manager because somebody had to be there to take the calls. Uh, at the end of the day, I got home. I realized I should have gone home too. My wife and daughter were totally distraught. And it gave me pause and... Uh, more than just pause. It, it was a very traumatic event. Uh, but time passes. A month later, late in October, I'm going through the annual routine. What am I going to get my clients for Christmas this year? You know, and the thought of another nice bottle of wine or a nice ten set just didn't feel right. And over the years, I'd always kept a spiral notebook by my side when I was making my calls through the day. And anytime. I had a random thought, and in this case, I had a question that I would have wanted to ask my parents. I wrote it in the spiral notebook. I shared that with a former, an old friend, and he was a graphic designer and a publisher, and uh, he, he had me put all those questions together into a little handbook. He helped me publish it, and I took that plus a little shoebox cassette recorder because we had to keep the gifts to clients under $25, 20 bucks for the cassette recorder, $5 for the handbook and the, the case. I, I sent out 200 of these gifts to my top clients with a note that said, this holiday is your family's gathered for the holidays. Start saving something worth more than just money. 
and I sent it out to all those clients. And typically I would get calls, thank you for this, thank you for that. But in this case, virtually every single client I had sent it to, I got a call and, and I know this is 2020, but for the majority of my clients were the, mate, were the patriarchs. I knew the matriarchs in passing. The calls I got were almost exclusively from the matriarchs. They told me what an incredible, thoughtful gift that was, that it meant so much to them to have a means of sharing their story, passing it on to their children. Yeah, that's really cool, Dennis. It sounds like you have like this, <clears throat> this whole buildup from your career that leads to this whole passion project um, with legacy stories. And I got to tell you, you're a damn good storyteller yourself <laughs> because <laughs> I've been sitting there just listening to every word you say it, and I can relate to a lot of this stuff. So we're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, let's get into – it sounds like this is where we're going to go next is like how legacy stories got started, what happened, and then how um, you end up uh, ending up over at CSI Financial. We'll be right back. Are you concerned about being able to get all of your affairs in order during this trying time? Are you troubled by what would happen if you ever became incapacitated? Maybe you've been procrastinating in the past to address these issues, but now, more than ever before, you know just how important it is to get everything documented. Well, don't worry, because we can get you taken care of right from the comfort of your own home. Welcome to the revolutionary My Life Card Plan Estate Plan Processing Platform, home of the last estate plan you'll ever need. We are very pleased you are here, and rest assured, we can offer you a complete estate planning experience regardless of where in the 50 states you may live. Our unique transformational system combines efficiency, convenience, and professional support at levels you never thought possible for setting up your estate plan. Moreover, we will provide you with powerful, user-friendly dynamics that put you in total control of your plan throughout your lifetime. Call us today at 888-316-6040 or go to www.csifinancialgroup.com and our team of specialists will be there to assist you every step of the way. What's up, Enrichers? Tim James here. I'm back with my co-host, Carter Wilcox. And today in the house, we've got Dennis Stack uh, from, as, and as from the first segment here, man, no wonder you created legacy stories. You just told this story that went on and it built up to this point. Um, it was awesome. I loved, I was, I was listening. I was on like, what's, what's the word, Carter? You're like hanging on a string. You, you were riveted, right? I mean, yeah, it's like, what's he going to say next? Right. It's yeah, like, yeah. and then and the it's like, yeah, and I started, I'm going to go see my parents this weekend. It's like, you know, my dad loves it when my grandkids come or my sons come over because he just starts telling stories like, you know, and 90 percent of them, I've heard him before. But every once in a while, he's telling a story. I'm like, shit, I never heard that before. And I got to sit down and listen to it, you know. So um, I'm really excited, me personally, because I kind of have an idea what Legacy Stories is. But why don't you guys just tell us, uh, Dennis, get into it. Like what how did Legacy Stories get born and then how does it how does an advisor use it to to help their clients okay well to pick up where i left off but uh, accelerate from there i realized that i had stumbled upon something that had incredible value that was very meaningful to people mm -hmm. and that i was not alone that a lot of people never took the time to ask the questions to hear the stories and unfortunately, those times have passed. And I found that everyone I spoke to in this regard fell into one of two categories. They either were the wish I had or, or re, yeah, the, you know, I, no, the, yeah, they said, I really should do this. And the other said, I really wish I had. Mm -hmm. And the ones that said, I really should do this, most of them never did. You know, they thought about it, but life gets in the way mm -hmm. and they forget about it. And so I, I went on a mission. I needed to develop. I wanted to develop this 2003. April 3rd was the expiration of my contract with UBS. I retired that day. 
my uh, my ex wife did not agree with my career decision. Uh, yeah, ex wife, <laughs> right? Uh, but I I started working with hospice. Uh, hospice uh, handles it back then more than a million patients a year. They employ half a million volunteers. I was so thankful for the gift that hospice provided me through that chaplain that I wanted to give back. And the concept of what they called life review was familiar to them, but they had no protocols. They had no standards. So I brought my, my little toolkit, if you will, the handbook and the cassette tape recorder. I threw together a PowerPoint presentation. And over the next three years, I trained more than 5,000 hospice volunteers with 800 hospices in 48 states. And it, uh, it felt really wonderful. There was no money in it, but it felt really wonderful to do. And I realized that as, as meaningful and as important as it is in hospice, it's too little too late. The average hospice patient is on service for two weeks when they've got six months worth of, of coverage. And so I wanted to bring this down the ladder. So I, uh, the ladder I refer to as the elder care continuum, as they call it, starts with uh, in-home care, followed by assisted living, skilled nursing, and then hospice. So I figured I'll take it to the front end. I took it to uh, the home care industry and I I managed to get a hold of uh, Visiting Angels. At the time, they were like the number two or three biggest home care agency in the country. I really made a solid connection with their COO. Uh, when I told her my story, she related that to her husband and she called me the next day to say, she woke up in the middle of the night. Her husband wasn't next to her. She found him in the basement listening to old recordings and crying that uh, he missed his mom's voice. And in fact, that's something I realized talking with hospice volunteers. Vast majority of the hospice volunteers are the widows, the, the women who volunteered as a means of giving back to hospice. And like I said, I talked to hundreds and hundreds of these people and almost to a one, they continue to pay their deceased spouse's cell phone bill for the simple fact that they could call up and hear, hi, this is George. I'm not here right now. Leave me a message. Because everybody's got pictures of their life. Almost nobody has recordings of the voice. And the voice carries so much more than just the words, the inflections, the laughter. I mean, there's so much more to it that if you don't capture it, it's gone. And so that uh, resonated with them. I got to say I, something. I had my girlfriend, let me just cut in here real quick. My girlfriend's got a, 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 a videotape of her dad when he was laying in the hospital right before he died. And it was just this little thing where he's like, cute. He says the word cute. And I, I watched her play that over and over and over again, you know, multiple times. And she just, she just lights up. She's like, Oh, my dad. And like, she's like, this is the last that I actually, all I have of his voice is this. And he just says, it, that's cute. And she got him yeah. like a, a present or something like that. I took it to yeah. him to the hospital and she listens to it all the time. And I thought, you know, how much better it would be if something meaningful touching something informative could be recorded and passed on. And that's when I started getting the idea that, um, that this might be the missing element for succession planning. Because mm -hmm. as I stated early in the earlier segment, 94% uh, of the time succession plans fail by the third generation. Well, there's another part of that formula is more than 90% of the time when the primary client passes away, the survivors seek new advisors. So what a magic formula if the financial advisor, who, as I mentioned earlier, becomes much more than just the financial person. They're a counselor. They're a trusted ear for the clients. What if that person actually got engaged and helped the client build their legacy, help leave their stories, leave their knowledge, their wisdom, their insight, their experience? What if that advisor was involved in that process? It's, it's a very natural segue. It should not always be only the advisor because 
I learned right away that when people tell their stories, we self-censor. Uh, best example would be uh, veterans who've seen combat. They're loath to share their wartime stories with their loved ones, but put them in a bar with a pitcher of beer and a bowl of pretzels and it's and another vet, and it's just nonstop. Uh, so because we share different parts of our lives with different people, there's definitely a place for the financial advisor to interview, but there's also a place for family and children and siblings and friends and <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and, and throughout all this, we all we all travel and exist in different circles. We have our professional lives. We have our social lives. We have our family lives. We have our fraternal lives, among others. And and those many times will overlap, but many times they don't. And different parts, different facets of ourselves are revealed in these different circles. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there's some way to holistically bring all this together to get a real 360 on people? And so that's when I came up with the idea that that this interview should be conducted by multiple parties, but unfortunately, they need a guide. They need a coach, if you will, somebody that can introduce the concept to them, get the first stories collected, and then teach them how to carry it on from there. And uh, so that's when, uh, well, I guess jumping back, uh, the, the home care business never really panned out. I mean, it's, it's perfect environment. You've got somebody paid to spend a lot of time with with these elders in their homes, but they're cooking, they're cleaning, they're chatting. And unfortunately, a lot of the home care agencies pay minimal wages and they just couldn't get the caregivers to provide this kind of service. But when I introduced it to them, that was right at the launch of uh, Library of Congress launched something called the Veteran History Project. And when I was doing the hospices, I, I established a 501c3. It was called Project Storykeeper. I was also one of the founding partners for the Library of Congress's Veteran History Project. And with the help of Visiting Angels, they went to their clients who were veterans and collected their stories to donate to the collection. So um, getting back to that. So, so the Visiting Angels was awesome. They, they, they collected hundreds of stories from veterans, World War II veterans, many, many of them no longer with us. And uh, I, I stopped doing that. And that's when I, I started thinking, you know, maybe financial advisors, this is something I finally brought it full circle and started to bring it home. And I was struggling to find a way because I knew I had something, but I didn't, I, I, didn't have the marketing. I didn't have the, the moxie to, to market things. And as a consequence, uh, my attorney that I worked and built that organization with, he was a tremendous fan of Ben. That dog, that dog really wants to tell you something. Yeah. Well, the lady of the house is outside and they're, they're just that they're not out there too. But, um, okay, so back to the story. Yeah. I talked with uh, John Goodson, the estate planning attorney. He, he was almost like a father to me in many ways. And uh, counseled with him as to, you know, my frustration at the time. And as it turns out, he had just gotten a new client this guy who had a, a talk radio station. It's called Let's Talk America. He had, a, I think it was like 600 different stations that he had his show on. And he had the likes of uh, Robbins, you know, the self-help gurus was the subject of the shows. And he had a deal that he shared on the back end revenues of book sales and what have you. But, at any rate, uh, he was tremendously successful at that business. They were making millions of dollars. He and his partner, his partner was here in Phoenix, as it turns out. Thomas in Tennessee. In fact, he had this huge estate up in the Smoky Mountains surrounded by national forests. It was just gorgeous. 
But at any rate, uh, he said that I should meet this guy, that maybe he can uh, find something to take this mainstream, what I was doing. And as it turned out, that weekend, I was going to be speaking at a national hospice conference in Baltimore. And I got on the phone with him. Well, the attorney hooked us up on a phone call and we met each other. We shared our stories. As it turned out from Tom's side, his partner, JP, with his recently found affluence, was going to start his own commuter airline, got himself his own pilot's license, bought himself some planes, and on a trip back from Long Beach, found his way straight into a mountaintop. Oh. And so, you know, that kind of ended that, if you will. And Tom was very taken by the whole thing. And so when I left Baltimore after the hospice conference, I stopped in Tennessee in Knoxville. Tom picked me up to the, at the airport, took me up to his Sky Mountain Ranch, and we spent the weekend together just sharing our, you know, commiserating almost more than anything else. And I shared with him my idea and my vision, what I'd like to do. And that's where we got started. Legacy Stories was the last of several different working titles. We had Treasury of Family Heritage. We had Life Lens. We had, we had several different renditions. And, and this was at a time my technology was analog. I was still in the cassette tape recorder world and we we're rapidly moving digital. So we started uh, looking into how we can deliver our product digitally. And the fact that Tom nor I had any knowledge about social networking and the internet and all the rest, we paid an insanely high price of tuition to the School of Hard Knocks and learned by doing. We got took by a lot of companies telling us how they would build us this special social network and, and how awesome it would be. And in fact, our very first rendition, the uh, guys building our, our network called it, you could write a book. <laughs> and we became a publisher's website for, you know, hopefully future authors. And that didn't sit well with me. That's not what my mission was. And so we, like I say, we went through several different versions, several modifications. We tried different features and all the rest. And we ended up with uh, LegacyStories.org, and it's a full-featured uh, multimedia digital archive, currently cloud-based, encrypted, social networking architecture, and we even had a smartphone app. And along the way, uh, what started out is just me and then Tom and I, we ended up with 42 partners. I mean, people answered the call. And I guess not surprisingly, a lot of these people were genealogists because they what they reflected to me is that they did the family trees, but what I did provided the leaves. And so there was a synergy there. And uh, as a consequence, we ended up getting discovered by the Mormon church. The Mormon church has a division. It's a billion dollar division called Family Search. It's the world's largest genealogical archive on the planet. The people who started uh, Ancestry.org were from that group. And they loved what we were doing. And uh, long story short, we became the first non-Mormon internet entity that achieved total trusted status with the Mormon church and family search. And we, I don't know if it's still to this day, but our members in Legacy Stories, you might not know this, Carter, but our members of our site are considered trusted content providers and can add content to the archives in family search. They're, they're very jealously protective. They don't want garbage getting in there. They only want verified, true information. And, and we went round and round with their counsel because according to their dictates, they're not allowed to host any content for people who are living. And my retort was, well, if you wait for them to die, good luck getting stories. <laughs> yeah. So, so we became the default living history library for the Mormon church. And 
Do you need to get that? <laughs> no, I just shut it off. I'm, I'm tr it's my computer guy. I'm going to send him a text. Okay. All right. So uh, we ended up doing very well with the Mormon Church. Uh, we 2015, we got runner up for most innovative technology in the field. We were celebrities at their Roots Tech Conference, which is the Super Bowl for genealogy. They had uh, a couple hundred thousand people pass through that event over the weekend. And uh, it was after that that uh, Tom and I recognized we needed to generate revenue. And that's when we brought it back home to the financial services world. I knew what this could do. I also was influenced by uh, a group called Age Wave. They did some studies, uh, Ken Dykewald, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the name, but he, he did uh, extensive study into the baby boomers, their buying patterns and, and the like, and came up with an incredible document that confirmed all of my suspicions as far as how this works, why it works, why it matters, and the rest. And subsequently, if a couple of years ago, Merrill Lynch contracted uh, Ken Dykewald to do a new age wave study for them. And they uncovered a couple of other tidbits. Specifically, that's where uh, I discovered that uh, financial advisors 90 plus percent of the time lose their client when the primary client passes. And this plugged in there because uh, and again, not wanting to be sexist, but what we do resonates with matriarchs. I mean, there's a division of labor in, in, in partnerships and in, in my marriage. You know, traditionally, one is the breadwinner. The other one takes care of the family. And this message, this system designed to build greater continuity, to great, build greater integrity within the family, particularly amongst the generations, like I say, it resonates with the matriarchs in a big way. And That's so, awesome. That's yeah. really awesome stuff. Hey, Dennis, we're going to have to take a quick break. But when we get back, I want to finish up with what you're saying there. And then also, um, Carter, I'd like you to chip in on why you purchased Legacy Stories. And um, maybe you have a story to share around that. Yeah. We'll be right back. All right. I'll be uh, I'll wrap it up right to that in fairly short order because I'm cool. 90 percent of the way done. Awesome. All right. Here we go. What's up? Sorry. What's Sorry. that? I said there's a lot of backstory for Dennis. <laughs> I know. That's good. That's what we want to hear. What's up in Richards? Tim James here with my co-host Carter Wilcox. And we're back with Dennis Stack. And man, I knew stories were powerful, but, um, you know. You built the whole business around it, Dennis. Why don't you finish up what you were saying, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna find out what why Carter purchased Legacy Stories. What was the story behind that? Yeah. So, well, as I said, I finally brought it back home to where I originally had hoped to use it was as a tool for financial advisors to develop much deeper, more meaningful, and durable relationships with their whole clients, not just the the patriarchs. And so to that end, the, the whole idea of the uh, financial advisor being the one to introduce the concept, to get the ball rolling by doing the first initial interviews and then coaching the family to conduct the subsequent parts, uh, it, it essentially is writing that financial advisor into the family Bible. I mean, you become part of that family legacy. Mm -hmm. And a very important part because you're delivering something that matters. And like I mentioned earlier, I don't know if we had it recorded, but I see legacy planning as a keystone of a tripartite. It's the estate planning, financial planning, legacy planning, that that unites the three, because in the first two cases, it's really just dealing with the valuables and mm -hmm. You know, making sure that what was intended to be passed on is passed on, but it doesn't tell the story. I would tell the financial advisors, I say, you guys doing an awesome job passing on the cake to the next generation. It's malpractice not to give the kids the recipe. And the recipe is the life experiences, the wisdom, the insight garnered over a life that created that wealth. And by capturing their, their wishes, their hopes, their 
greatest achievements, their biggest failures, that becomes an archive that hope someday, maybe if that third generation who wanted for nothing and threw everything away and continue to do so, that what if they actually want to, to do something with it? Unfortunately, when they encounter a problem in that family business that grandma and grandpa figured out, grandma and grandpa are gone for 20 years. The, the answer's not there. In this case, it will be. And it can make it it could make that difference. And we refined it further to what I call the family narrative. You understand the concept of a mission statement for businesses. It uh, helps to define the business, who it is, where they are, and the direction they want to go. It provides continuity through successive management. The family narrative is that for the family. Because it doesn't matter how successful we are as financial advisors, if the family fails, everything fails. And so by collecting, building this family narrative, which is constituted of the who we are, where we came from, how we got here, what we stand for. Instead of each successive generation feeling like they're, they're isolated in the universe, they recognize themselves as part of a continuum. Mm -hmm. And when they know that backstory, when they know the history of their favorite team, they become loyal. And so this way, these succeeding generations, instead of being spoiled, entitled, uh, I won't go farther than that, but uh, instead of feeling like they're just isolated in the universe, they recognize they're part of something greater than themselves. And hopefully, just hopefully, maybe they'll recognize that and take something we used to call pride in belonging. And hopefully with a little dose of pride and, a, and an instruction guide, maybe so many succession plans won't fail. Yeah, so that's actually, Dennis, that's a perfect segue into um, Tim's question about what did CSI Financial Group see in legacy stories? Uh, you know, Tom Cormier, who you mentioned earlier uh, in this podcast, he reached out to me early on in the infancy stage of CSI Financial Group. And I recognized early on the value that that brought for, for an advisor. Right. And um, and then, you know, I would go on and do my own thing and then he would trickle back into my life. And then we, I would get all, you know, geared up and ready to go and everything. And then, Something started happening between the two of you. I think it was called retirement. You wanted to retire, right? You were like, I'm ready to be sort of like done with this. And he got <laughs> me as something of a, of a value that I could maybe buy the whole gamut of, of legacy stories and, and how that intertwined with our estate planning, a.k.a. family succession planning, that we have been doing for the last three and a half, four years, it was a perfect segue into um, that continuity for us. And that's why I ultimately, whenever he made it become available, we won't go into the backstory about how we were the second person that he came to, you know, <laughs> someone else was interested before we were to buy it. Um, that didn't pan out. Luckily for us that it didn't pan out. Um, and then once it became available again, I'm, I snatched it up. I'm like, because the advisors we want to work with, and, and Tom and I had this conversation many, many times over. We both completely inherently understand that a transaction has to occur to monetize a relationship. But if you want to be a transformational advisor, you have to have what you just talked about, estate planning financial planning and legacy planning, right? That that triumvirate, if you will, of necessary pieces that can truly differentiate the advisor partner network that we work through. That was the final piece of the puzzle that I needed to, to bring together what was necessary to create that differentiator for advisors that are out there competing in that, that, 10 to 11,000 baby boomers a day that are retiring for the next 15 years. This was the piece that they needed and why I wanted Dennis to be on here as a guest on our podcast, as we continue to refine legacy stories.org 
to ultimately differentiate you against your competition. So that was why I finally made the investment and, and it was, it was the timing for legacy stories for CSI to take that over was it was, it was paramount. It was providential, whatever you want to call it. Um, and Dennis, your backstory and what you built really gave me um, the ribbon, right? The, 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 the final piece of that puzzle I was talking about and uh, the, the icing on the cake for the advisor partner platform to ultimately differentiate these advisors and become and help them to become transformational. And really, and I've been saying this for a long time, I don't believe that if you don't have all of these different pieces, you cannot call yourself a trust. But if you have all these integrated pieces that make up the advisor partner platform, legacy stories, the East Day plan portfolio, and the, the, the wealth management financial planning aspect of it, you cannot call yourself a trusted advisor. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, totally, I totally agree with that, Carter, what you just said. I'm really glad that you brought this in. What a, what a, what a huge tool to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. Like I thought when I was doing it, we had the triangle of trust, the CPA, the, the the state planning attorney and the financial advisor. We brought that all together under one roof. But the this this the storytelling part, the legacy part, it's 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 really huge. What a way to bulletproof yourself. And then, you know, when people do people pass away, you don't lose that, you know, just from a monetary standpoint, you don't, you don't lose that chunk of that business, just 90 percent of it gone. So you can actually create a legacy business like if you want to have your son or daughter or somebody you really like run your business you know that a lot of that money is going to stay it's like it's going to stay in the family and it's going to stay in your financial firm's family and you guys can grow together and uh you know it's it's a really powerful concept so i think we're getting close to that time i went a little extra today because i wanted to finish up that story um and then find out from uh from dennis and then find out how your take was and how you guys got connected but we can now it's time to flip the script, Dennis. Now you get to ask me a question. Anything about health? What would you like to ask? Well, I think uh, as as uh, Carter just pointed out, there's a triumvirate here. There's health. There's the wealth because you can't enjoy the wealth without the health. Mm -hmm. And the legacy stories provides the wisdom. So the health, wealth and wisdom, when you have those in harmony, when you take a holistic approach and your clients are just not another trade, that they matter to you, you all of a sudden matter to them. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it, it kind of sort of becomes that old saying, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So Dennis, do you have any questions for me personally for yourself or for a friend or a family member or just in general, any questions about health that you'd like to try to get answered today? Oh gosh. Um, some people are wanting to lose weight. Some people, you know, we're not, we don't need it. We don't need to talk about erectile dysfunction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not so, a problem, but uh, no, we were joking about that earlier. <laughs> no, I, 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 I had had a scare coming up August. I think it'll be six years ago. I had a heart attack. I died mm. and I managed to come around and I got into banner health or banner heart had a emergency operation had a stint put in. And I'll tell you, it was a wake up call for me. Yeah, I bet. I started going to the gym. I, you know, I, 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 to this day, I hate going to the gym. I don't like it. It hurts, <laughs> but I'm religious about it. I go three days a week. I spend about an hour, hour and a half there. Uh, after I started going, uh, I lost 20 pounds. I lost two inches around the waist. Uh, I'm in better shape now than when I was 30 years old. Back on awesome. wearing, wearing the clothes I wore when I was 30 years old because I still have them. They they're, back, they're back in style now. Yeah. So uh, that, that my, my only concern is uh, finding enough do, to do to keep keep me occupied. I mean, I've uh, like my father before me, I, I was a workaholic in the 20 years I was in the business. All my vacations were centered around long holiday weekends. I never, ever took a sick day. I mean, I was obsessed, consumed by the markets and my clients and, and the work. And 
And after I left that, uh, the work doubled. I mean, building what we built and the legacy stories and and promoting it and trying to make it a sustainable entity took me 10 hours a day, six days a week. And now all of a sudden, thanks to Carter, or I can blame Carter, I have nothing to do anymore. <laughs> I wake up, I look at my calendar, it's blank. You know, I've got my three days a week, I go to the gym, and outside of that, it's like... Well, I'll put you to work. I got some stuff to do. <laughs> so we're not going to let you skate out of here without asking me a question. So what's one thing about health that you'd like to learn more about or you have a question about? Whether it's diet or detoxing or anything around exercise, whatever. COVID, doesn't matter. Whatever you want to ask a question about. Um, well, this last year has given all of us pause. Maybe over-focused on our health uh, too much, but... I worry about the the fallout of people's health from the protocols that were employed in the COVID, the shutdowns and the social distancing and the rest. I, I, I worry that people are unduly afraid to interact and connect with one another. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think uh, I'd love to see it go back to normal. I'd hate to think that the handshake is a relic of the past. Because in my life, in my career, when you shook somebody's hand and looked them in the eye, that meant something. Yeah. But um, no, I'm, I'm health wise. I, you know, aside from my heart, I've I've never been healthier, and you know, I I would love more people to take that moment to look at their own lives and change whatever habits they may have. Maybe it's a uh, consumption of things that they don't need to be consuming. Uh, maybe it's just exercising more, but becoming more conscious of their health and to find an expert, somebody who can advise them on things that they obviously don't know. So I, I do believe that your integration with Carter uh, is crucial. I mean, that we, our wealth is nothing without our health. Yeah, he, he, he actually sounds like he's a paid spokesperson. If you <laughs> know any better, right? Um, well, let me read. Let me read through the through the um, um, through the message there. What you're, I think you're trying to ask, and I've actually been wanting to know this too. What are the long term mental effects that are are that are happening for? You know, our kids and grandkids. You know, a lot of our advisors, right? They they talk about legacy stories and everything that's who we're trying to pass along these types of things right so what are the types of stories and what are the types of mental effects that are going to happen to these younger generations and what's the effect of the protocols um you know sort of again segueing and sort of answer asking a question for dennis yeah well that's like it's that's a that's a big question it deserves a big answer but i'll try to cover like some of the main points I think, you know, physically, obviously, all the protocols and the things that the government is um, perpetrating, per, uh, perpetrating on us is um, untested and unwarranted. Um, if we take masks as an example, if we look at masks and our oral health as an example, um, we've been trying to build the awareness of the risks of masks to you and your child, not just about like masks are good, they're the best thing ever, or masks are bad, you know, pro-mask, anti-mask. That's where they want to have us. They want us to be divided. Then we're easy Pol to call polarized, polarized against each other. We want to go right down the middle with um, with facts and real science. You know, s systems biology has revealed that masks disrupt our oral microbiome, as an example. Right. So what does that mean? Well, dentists are reporting an increase of tooth decay, um, gum disease and cracked teeth, like up 50 percent rise. And we also know that child's oral microbiome is a development predictor of their future health. So if a child's wearing a mask all the time, they're raising the oral, the temperature of their mouth, raising the acidity, and they're destroying and creating too many bad, or they're creating too many of these bad bacteria. And that's going to disrupt their entire immune system, you know, for the rest of their life. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue. Plus, kids can't even see their face. I saw this one kid, he came on, he was like, my teacher has her mask down and she's yelling at us all the time. Like, like I took my mask down, took a sip of water, and put it back up. She's like, you're not supposed to drink water until you're in the car with your parents, like outside. He's like, 
I saw my teacher in um in like the grocery store and the teacher didn't know me but i knew her because she always had her mask off but and um but she's never seen my face so she didn't know who i was but she teaches him in school so this whole thing is isolation distancing fear um you know there's there's a lot of ramifications i think that you know it's designed to um get rid of uh, small businesses uh, corporate businesses, it's it's okay to go into Walmarts and Targets and these big stores and walk around and touch everything and, you know, but shut down Ma and Pa's, they're all shut down. You, know, you can't go to a restaurant and have dinner with your family and go to a birthday party, right? So there's there's social ramifications. Um, lots of suicides are up. They predict about 800,000 people have died of suicide from the lockdowns. Uh, people not being able to go out like you, um, Dennis, that want to hustle and provide for your family. If you can't do that, and you're losing your house and your mortgage, you might just take your life just to get the heck out of here, right? Um, yeah. I had a question for you. In fact, all right. I, guess I, I was a little flat-footed when you first asked me. But uh, I, I did have a client in my career who was one of the leading authorities on allergies. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wrote multiple books, and she gave me the, the thumbnail of, of what her theory was. She... She blames the rise, the dramatic increase in the number of people. You can develop an allergy anytime, but she attributes it back to the Jimmy Carter years when we became energy conscious and we sealed our buildings and we recirculated the air, that that was uh, part and parcel of causing a, a spike in, in allergic responses. She also had a a horse she rode hard about not allowing our immune systems to be in top condition. That if we live in too antiseptic of an environment, our immune systems are going to get lazy. Yes, and if right. you have your immune system laying on the couch, binge watching Netflix, the first challenge that comes along, it's going to fail. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. She's right on both accounts. So yeah, we're, we're just disconnected like from nature. So when you come into a house, like right now, this paint's off gassing, the paints in your house are off gassing, you know, there's just, there's toxic chemicals and stuff. So the older homes were more drafty, air was coming in and circulating. She right. So what I've realized in my last 11 years is that allergies, whether they be food allergies or seasonal allergies or pet allergies are a combination of toxic buildup in the digestive tract, the blood, the fat and the muscle tissue, long-term nutrient deficiencies and stress. And on top of it now, we have stress from like 5G, 3G, 4G, cell phones, Wi-Fi, smart meters, all these things. I've got a book over there by Dr. Elizabeth Plords um, on EMF freedom. And it, it, you know, a lot of people, allergies start creeping up as soon as the smart meters started going in. So it's, it's not just like, you know, one thing or another, it could be one thing. It could be combination of two three four things that you don't even you don't even see but what i have seen is people that have had pet allergies and and seasonal allergies um and 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 uh, food allergies when they when they detox their digestive tract and they keep their digestive tract clean they clean their colon they clean their intestinal lining and they learn how to do these things and they flood their body with nutrition recolonize the good bacteria in their gut that come from the soil microbiome or the bacteria in the soil um and, and then they, they have health, lead healthier lives, start exercising like you did, eat healthier, fresher foods. Then within six months to two years, those allergies go away in a lot of cases or the severities drop. I mean, I've had people that have, like, their eyes swell up really bad during allergy season and they're just miserable in the shower, taking antihistamines all the time. And now they just have a sniffle or two, you know, two years later. But that's why it has to get down back to a lifestyle. We have to get keep the body you know, cleaned up, but we got to actually get back in the dirt. Now I've talked about this before, but we have people that are really ill that are trying to heal themselves. I have their friends and family from all over the world send uh, undisturbed soil to them in boxes so they can get that soil and get those, those oral, those soil microbiome because it's one of the biggest, um, it's a big part of our immune system. A huge part of our immune system is that bacteria. And there, there's a recent French study that showed that Children with dogs and pets that go outside versus children with pets that stay indoors versus children with no pets. The ones with the pets that went outside had 47% less ear infections. 
Why is that? Well, it's because the animals are going outside and bringing, bringing the soil-based bacteria into the home. So we need to get our feet and our hands. We got to get back into nature, back to the forest, back to the beaches, get outside. It's the exact opposite of what you were saying. What are the ramifications of these like lockdowns and what they're doing? They're actually destroying our immune system and destroying our health at so many levels. It's not even funny. Like everything they're telling us to do, exact opposite of what we should be doing. There's, there's no conversation about boosting the immune system. It's all about fear, run and hide, sterilize your hands with sanitizers, even though they don't tell you that it kills 99.9% .9 of the bacteria on your hands and leaves the 0.1 behind that's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger that you won't eventually be able to do anything with. Like it's happening in hospitals right now. And, but you are that, that, that Purell or that crap you're putting on your hands goes through your skin into your bloodstream, no liver to filter it. And then it gets into your gut and it's killing your, or your gut microbiome. Right. So like you said, you can't just distill it or purify yourself that way. I mean, we can clean ourselves up with clean water and clean food and that kind of stuff. But we still need to be exposed to things. Our, what you alluded to is called our interferon system, Dennis. The interferon system is part of our immune system. It wants to be exposed to viruses. It wants to be exposed to bacteria. Because when that happens, it figures it out and it creates the necessary antibodies or the, or the, um, the basically your, your immune system figures out the solution for it for life plus a thousand times over. So every time you're exposed to something, your immune system gets like a thousand times stronger. That's called evolution. You know, putting people in homes that are locked up airtight and rubbing your hands with Purell and staying away from everybody is de-evolution. It's stupid. It makes no sense. It's not working. And we, we, we just have to say no. I mean, that's where we're at right now. We have to just say no. And um, then everything can go back to normal as soon as people decide to. Yeah, well, that's one of the things I'm currently still very disturbed about, and understandably so. It's the elders in our community mm -hmm. that are most susceptible to the corona. Yeah. But the problem I see, and I've reflected this because we're still working with the elder care communities, is which is worse, protecting them from getting a disease or depriving them of the one thing they live for? Well, I think the answer to this is that is allow them to do the one thing they live for and teach them how to boost their immune system. Yeah. Vitamin A, green leafy vegetables, vitamin D, vitamin D3, going outside, fresh air. Um, they can take quercetin, over-the-counter drug with, with the zinc. Quercetin will transport the zinc into the cell to stop this virus from replicating. High-dose vitamin C IVs if they get it and they start showing symptoms. We have solutions. They even have pharmaceutical solutions, hydroxychloroquine and zinc or or uh, ivermectin, and they have uh, Dr. Richard Bartlett now in Texas, 100% success rate with budesonide, a very old inhaled steroid with zinc, right? So there's there's tons of solutions, but it's uh, it's it's like so simple, people don't they can't believe it can be that easy, but it is. But remember back in the day when the when when the the sailors were dying, and they said these sailors are diseased. No, they had a vitamin C deficiency. It's called scurvy. They give them some lemons and some oranges and some limes. That's what they call the British sailors, limeys. And they didn't have scurvy anymore. So was it a disease? No, it was a nutrient deficiency. And with 85% of the nutrients farmed out of our soils more than ever today that we have to re, we got to put nutrients back into our body and minerals and trace minerals and vitamins and hormones and oxygen and phytochemicals and enzymes. These are the things and the micronutrients our bodies are missing today. You're not going to get it in cooked and processed foods. We have to get back to fresh, unprocessed, uncooked foods at least at some percentage of our food by weight for us to boost our immune systems back up and quit worrying about all this stuff. Have some fun, dance around, jump in some mud puddles, do some yoga, clap your hands, play with your grandkids. There's an energetic thing. You talked about shaking hands. When we come into contact with each other, we actually raise our vibrational frequency. Human beings are, we're pack animals and we're light beings. We're vibrational. We're electric. That's why our heartbeat goes beep, beep. When we're hooked up to an EKG, we're literally electrical beings. So everything that we're told to do, completely wrong. I, I completely disagree with almost all of it. And um, I think you're right. And now that I, I, I know what you need to do, you need to join the Truth, Freedom, and Health Movement with Dr. Shiva Ayadure. We will keep you plenty busy. And we need people like you that have knowledge and have uh, a lot of uh, drive and are smart and are a decent person that really wants to help people. Um, and you can go to vashiva.com forward slash join. And, and you can get educated and get trained, and we'll have a lot of stuff to do for you, brother. <laughs>
Dennis, you didn't know that we were going to get you uh, find you another job on this. Got you a job, buddy. Oh, it's all good. We'll have yeah. to have him back on because if he ends up going there and joining and finding out the stuff in six months, we'll have him back on, and then he can tell us what he's been doing with the with the Truth, Freedom, and Health movement. Yeah, no, no, I, I think that'll be awesome. So, uh, <laughs> well, hey, you know what? I know that we've run a little bit long today. Um, Dennis's story in the first segment, and then continuing into the second segment and everything. I mean, I, I, I could, I was literally on the edge of my seat, you know. On and I, I and Richards, listen up. Um, I need you to understand that it is more the thing that took me the most into deciding that legacy stories was ideally suited for our advisor partner network was whenever I learned from Tom Cormier about it's not just about the valuables that you leave behind. It's the values. And if you don't leave that legacy behind, all the wealth will matter. So you said something earlier, um, and in Richards, I think this was spectacular by Dennis. It's the health, it's the wealth, and the wisdom. That is the triumvirate that we are trying to bring together. So, um, you know, for my co-host, Mr. Tim James of Chemical Free Body in Richards, I am your co-host, Carter Wilcoxon, CSI Financial Group, um, Dennis Stack, thank you for being a phenomenal guest today on the Health and Wealth Podcast. Uh, make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and you can get all of these recordings by going to our website at the Health and Wealth Podcast Show.com. Dennis Stack, do you have any last words that you want to share with our enrichers today? Uh, thank you, Carter, and thank you, Tim. You're carrying on something that was a core of my being for, geez, almost 20 years now. And I am so happy to know that it's enhanced, that not only understand it, but that we'll hopefully take it to where it really needs to get. Awesome. Dennis, thank you very much, Tim James. Until next week, everybody have a great, wonderful rest of your day. Live that abundant life. And uh, again, like, share, and subscribe to the Health and Wealth Podcast Show. Hey, Enrichers. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Carter Wilcoxon. And I'm your host, Tim James, and by God, we are committed to helping you guys have fat wallets, flat bellies, so tune in again for another episode and make sure to like, share, and drink a lot of water. Or beer. You have just listened to the Health and Wealth Podcast with Carter and Tim. 